Hello, and thank you for joining me. My name is Carmen Bugan. I am a past Creative Arts Fellow in Literature at Wilson College, Oxford, the home of the Life Writing Series. And currently I work as an independent writer living in the United States. I'm grateful to the Life Writing Center for inviting me again to discuss work in progress. And today I'd like to talk about writing a novel as a way to explore the significance of certain life experiences. Writing a novel is proving to be a challenging project because for the first time, I'm turning to the genre of fiction in order to talk about real life events. So I still feel an overwhelming responsibility to the factual, especially because I'm starting from archival research about my family. But this time around, I need to imagine what goes on in someone else's mind. My aim with writing this novel is to understand the narrative of oppression that was at the heart of the Romanian secret police, the Securitate. It's an experiment that leads me to search deeper into literary language as I seek to gain insights into how politics shape human relationships, changing the perception of intimate family life including motherhood. Moving from the factual to the fictional happened because I began with the question, why do people behave the way they do? In order to answer this question, I found myself pursuing another, which is, how does one get inside the mind of the character? I will explain first the factual aspects of this project and then move to the creative challenges it presents. My work engages with political oppression dissidents and exile, and is based on my family's opposition to the dictatorial regime of Nicolae Ceausescu during the Cold War in Romania. In 2010, and then again in 2013, I have been researching my family's secret police surveillance files, which have been declassified and made available to people who were subjected to political persecution. One of these files, deals with my mother's situation as the wife of a political prisoner in 1983. Her file arrived to me in 2013, almost exactly 30 years after her interrogations by the Romanian Securitate in a children's hospital, where she was with my brother, who had been born just weeks before my father's arrest on March 10, 1983, for protesting against Ceausescu's war. Immediately following my father's arrest in Bucharest, my mother found herself with a new friend in the district's children's hospital in Galatz, where she was ordered to remain till further notice, and where she was questioned at all hours of the day and night for nearly two months. Lieutenant Major Cecilia Diaconesa, the protagonist of my novel, was an officer of the Securitate who on 12 March 1983 several weeks after the birth of her own baby daughter, was assigned to extract confessions from my mother, who was suspected of collaborating in my father's public protest and to prevent my mother from committing unthinkable acts. She was admitted to the infectious ward, where according to one secret police report, there were 22 mothers sharing 12 beds and where the children shared cots. Using the legend were fictional guise of a fellow patient, she was ordered to gain the trust of her target. My brother, a few weeks old, was struggling for his life. Lieutenant Cecilia Diaconesa was selected for the job because she had a baby who could be used as a prop in order to defend my mother. And because according to the details of her work order, she was unknown in the informative network so she could infiltrate easily with the other informants recruited to spy on my mother. This is how in 2013, reading Cecilia's handwritten reports, I found myself in possession of revelations and questions that brought the character of Cecilia Diaconesa to life. I knew about her from my mother, but my mother said she was so suspicious of everyone. And indeed the reports show that she had at least six other people, doctors, nurses, fellow mothers, monitoring her in her state of mind, that she wasn't entirely certain whether Cecilia was just a sympathetic patient or an informer. When she came up in the files, eloquent, writing about herself in the first person and then in the third person, 
not mentioning a word about her baby beyond the obligation to say that my brother and her daughter were placed in the same cot. I wanted to know what made her take the job. She seemed obedient and willing, not lighthearted, but taking her job on in stride. She was very kind to my mother. She even generously lent her overcoat. Mother was rushed with my brother by ambulance from one hospital to another in her nightgown. At the end of this presentation, I will um, give you a couple of files, one with her work order and one with one of Cecilia's reports, so you get a sense of her handwriting. Having my own children brought my thoughts of Cecilia to a different place. She resurfaced to the lens of motherhood. Why would anyone at all risk the life of a healthy baby by placing that baby in an overcrowded infectious ward? What happened to the sense of motherly protection? I developed a repulsion that I couldn't quite put away. I felt the urge to write her out of my life. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that in order to write her out, I needed to write her first. I wanted to know what she thought and what she felt, but I remained uninterested in looking her up and interviewing her, as talking to her would have taken me to a different and predictable intellectual and emotional place. I would simply claim moral privilege as a victim who demands an explanation. This would not offer much beyond the self-satisfying, perhaps even self-aggrandizing analysis of a bad person. So I wondered what would be like to imagine her situation honestly, in all of its complexity, to have an incursion into her mind on my own. I had all the outward description of her work order, her style of writing, her handwriting, and the story of so many people who collaborated with the machinery of oppression. The information was all there for me. What I didn't have was my own journey down her path. If I could look at her as a writer looks at a character, I could find my way in. And here's the voice of the narrator of the novel in the opening poem. Defining. The best I could do was imagine her. The way you divine water with a willow branch. I wanted something beautiful to stir inside her. When I was a child and lived with my grandparents, people dug wells for their families in their backyards. Somewhere under the garden, there was a vein of pure water invisible to us that was to nourish us and water our crops if we could sense it under the earth. The younger people did not believe in diviners they called the diggers, but my grandparents insisted on a ritual because it had been always done that way. I don't recall the diviner, but I remember one must know how to recognize a source. I fell into her. I became her. I wore her double names like a war trophy. No one can explain his or her times. One simply lived. Well, this seemed fine as a way to position myself towards her. And the poetry was very useful because it allowed me to go directly to the expressive language where I feel most comfortable. But then I wanted her to speak for herself for the rest of the book. What would she say about her life, her background, her choices? After all, the Securitate had a very large network and many of those who informed on us were ordinary people we knew. No one I knew was particularly evil. Those who worked for the Securitate had many reasons to accept the job. They received access to more food, better schooling. They enjoyed certain rewards. Some were intimidated. Some chose it because of their ideological convictions. Ideas are extremely powerful. It is true that some took up the work because it made them feel like they had power over other people. These were the people I dreaded. The mind of the oppressor is just a step away from the mind of the oppressed or from that of the onlooker. It's just that many of us don't have a reason to step onto that ground. The immediate problem I faced was the choice of form and language. I needed both the intensity of lyric language that moves through imagery and sound and the larger space of prose where Cecilia could be allowed to talk heart to heart to make her own voice heard 
was she reaches such intimacy with my mother to the point that my mother asked for her overcoat. I wondered what the coat looked like, what it smelled like. How did she place herself in relation to a vulnerable woman trying to dissuade her from committing suicide? As a writer, I was once again on my own in search for language down the road I didn't know. I hoped to get into that intimate space between the two women, feel what both must have felt, and walk down the mental path of Cecilia to see how far I can understand her reasoning. Down that path, I hoped to find the language by which we deceive ourselves and take those turns that are morally crippling and yet so shockingly ordinary. Her testimony had to be expressed in prose, so I decided on the epistolary form. She would have to write a series of letters. I wrote Love Me Tender first as a novel in prose, and then I transformed it into a novel in verse, repainting the prose of the letters. I titled the final version called. The plot line is completely invented. The novel begins with Cecilia's grown son, a man with his own family, who confronts his mother over her participation in secret police surveillance. Here is Anton, her son, after he discovers her story in the declassified government files. Anton felt disoriented by the secret police speak of the informing reports. They were written in a third person, and she had referred to herself as the source. She had built impersonal vignettes about someone else's life that read more like play acts in which the victim was trapped into confessing a political opinion with a seemingly innocent question. Her own feelings, her own opinions on the matter were sanitized. She herself was more or less a puppet whose strings you could easily see. There seemed no remorse behind the words, no sense of reflection. He had grown to hate her handwriting. No long uh, before, not long before receiving her letters, he had piled the hundreds of pages inside large transparent white boxes and sealed them shut. Sometimes one has to let go of parents, he had told himself. The arrival of her letters to him felt both like a lifeline and a fresh opening into a painful wound. Anton abandons her because he feels betrayed and ashamed. The public unmasking of his mother affects his own family life and his work as a journalist who, ironically, writes with passion and clarity about social justice. Cecilia turns to writing a series of letters, hoping that she could regain the love of her son. I brought her as close as I could to the point where she could speak for herself as a mother, as a professional, and as an old woman who would have to come to terms with her life before dying. Her letters needed to be in a prose that could express the language of memory, her recent onset of Alzheimer's, her views on the political situation of her own time, and her philosophical inclinations. Here she is just before she begins writing the letters to her son after the initial confrontation. The silence continued for months. Cecilia lived by imagining talking to someone, anyone who would listen to her side of the story in that faithful conversation with Anton. She had been walking around the block talking to herself, remembering Anton as a child, as a young man. She lingered to notice how the buildings had fallen into decrepitude since she had left home, how she had aged without realizing in the same way as those buildings whose eaves sank and gutters rusted leaving brown streaks against the neglected cement walls. She was aware how different the story in her heart was from what had broken out in strident print, how easily she could be discounted now even by her own son. A memory of Anton, crying or giggling, keeps nagging her. The child's voice seems to fill the room with a sort of love innocence. She tries to locate the memory but fails and goes back to thinking about conviction or desperation mixed with stupidity, disguises conviction. She can no longer tell. It's a lifetime since, and the whole thing had remained like a deep scar from a burn. The yellow, brown, and purple skin that looks disturbing to strangers is no longer noticeable to her because of familiarity. What is political conviction anyway? Is it, in all honesty, nothing more than being on the side of winners 
rather than on the side of what is right, where most people lose, a kind of safety in numbers? And what is morality? People do stuff to their children every day. Think of those who abandon their families on a street and never return to them. Nobody bothers about those wretches. An overblown question, she thinks. And here is an excerpt from the letter to Anton, one of the letters, where Cecilia acknowledges the guilt she felt while performing the job of extracting confessions from her target. There was no way on earth I could have done more harm to that, to that woman than it was already done to her. An officer came to take her to interrogation and she turned to me crying. I don't know you, but could you please look after my child? I will be gone for another three hours. There was no need for introductions. By then I had forgotten my line anyway. We were in a ward with children who suffered from lung infections. There were not enough beds, so children shared cots and mothers took turns sleeping in shared beds overnight. I was certain that you would catch something there, so I tried to be as thorough as I could about reporting on the woman and leave that hellish place as soon as possible. She and I shared the bed for mothers. You and her son shared the cot. You were curious, looked around, looked at me, looked at me, and I felt lost. A few days later, the boy began to feel better. And when your father came to bring you your powdered milk enriched with vitamins, I shared the bottles with the mother and I fed you both exactly the same amount of milk. She was grateful and began trusting me. The more she trusted me, the more I hated myself, the more nauseated I became. We were victims of the same fears, you see. And I was watching myself destroying her and risking your help in order to survive those days, have remained etched in my mind forever. Her bony arms, chalk white cheeks, her burning brown eyes, her thin breasts with no milk. That pale, beautiful boy for whom I prayed every night that he would live and he will never ever find out about the shadow woman I was, who was prying on his mother. I dreamed my breasts were leaking tears the size of eggs made of hot melting gold, she told me one night. She barely slept, if ever. I described her state of mind as hallucinatory in one report. Her milk had dried during the interrogations from the stress. I watched her walk out in the hospital courtyard and scream with the child in her arms, talk to him as if he were a grown up. Mostly it was the black hatred of her husband for having abandoned her, hatred which I transcribed dutifully and submitted to my superiors as evidence that she did not help plan the protest. And you, with your little red cotton teddy bear in my arms, in the boy's cot, then back in my arms. The fear that you will become ill in there, then anger that they made me bring you, that you had to be part of their endless props, their machinery of intimidation. The fact that I felt powerless to even tell your father what was happening. The anguish that I one day I will have to explain myself to you, despite all the promises they made that this assignment was going to be wiped off all the records. The microphone under my shirt 24 hours a day. So even my going to the toilet was recorded, you crying, the boy crying, the horror that I gave myself away and I would end up hunted if I'd shown weakness. The horror that I had to choose between putting that woman in prison quickly so you and I could get out of there fast. We're trying to protect her, but prolonged being our stay and risking your help further. The most shocking aspect of my incursion into Cecilia's mind was that while I traveled along with her, imagining her intellectual and emotional life, my feelings towards her in her predicament began changing. Well, this should have come as no surprise. Her self-justification was nothing more than the very typical story I know all too well of how people became informers and were trapped into the job against their will. I also had her recite the political orthodoxy of the time, which became mixed with opportunism fueled by hopelessness and material hardship so common in the Cold War years. <laughs> 
The more closely I examined how she made her choices, the more convincing her narrative became. By the end of the novel, novel my relationship with her character transformed. When I finished writing, I understood the complexity of the motives that erode our moral well-being. Her induction into the world of informers follows the classic recruitment methods outlined in the Securitate manuals. Those who refused to follow the orders found themselves scarred for life. By the time I completed the second draft of the book that eventually became the manuscript of Fog, I was both terrified and felt a sense of liberation. I felt as if I was answering for myself the question Mandersham asked himself in his poem, My Time. My time, my brute, who would be able to look you in the eyes? George Orwell opens his essay, The Lion and the Unicorn, Socialism and the English Genius, with an observation about the language we use to justify participating in conflict. As I write, he says, highly civilized human beings are flying overhead trying to kill me. And then he explains, they do not feel any enmity against me as an individual, nor I against them. They are only doing their duty as the saying goes. Most of them, I have no doubt, are kind-hearted, law-abiding men who would never dream of committing murder in private life. On the other hand, if one of them succeeds in blowing me to pieces with a well-placed bomb, he will never sleep any the worse for it. He is serving his country, which has the power to absorb him from evil. From evil. We can do anything, including killing each other, if the motive from which we proceed feels solid. That solidity comes from a narrative that is universally understood. It is noble to die for one's country. It is noble to kill for one's country. And it is noble to die and kill for freedom or for the revolution. The complication, of course, occurs in the interpretation of patriotism, national pride, political and religious affiliation, and so on. That interpretation is rooted in language. For the writer, this is fertile ground for thinking as it has to do with the employment of language to effect a specific course of conduct. It is not poetic language to be sure, but it is emotionally compelling language which affects how we live our lives. The literature dealing with this narrative of duty can expose the reasoning that leads people to sacrifice themselves and their own families for what could be a fatal misunderstanding of the greater good. Such exposure might make us all better readers of political language and slow us down when it comes to embracing causes that damage everyone in involved. Perhaps we should spend more time trying to understand how people lose their grip on decency and compassion as much as we are repelled by their actions. It's almost too facile of an exercise to study how victims overcome their condition because we are attracted by the resistors whom we invest with the sense of moral superiority, confirming thus our own beliefs. While I think that a deeper understanding of the various narratives that contribute to oppression can help us protect ourselves against many forms of tyranny. So what can we ask of literature? We have a language that allows us to call out to the opposing camps, even if often that calls travels only one way and it is not answered with reconciliation. It's the language that steals us in the expectant silent. I have a specific war image in mind. Speaking about 1936 Spain in his memoir, Wind, Sand and Stars, the aviator and writer Antoine de Saint-Exupéry lamented the disastrous effects of ideology, the loss of perspective on a gift of life, and with these, the loss of our common humanity. He wrote, here is Spain, a man is simply stood up against the wall and he gives up his entrails to the stones of the courtyard. You have been captured. You are shot. Reason, your ideas are not our ideas. On both sides of the political parties, spy upon the stirrings of man's conscience as upon the workings of a disease. And I close the quote. In this context, Exupéry recalls the conversation between two friends who become enemies across the trenches. 
Antonio, what are you fighting for? Leo shouts in the night. Spain. Antonio shouts back to the darkness. You? Leo answers. The bread of our brothers. And then they shout to each other. Good night, friend. In this exchange, I see the tragic condition in which we often find ourselves as victims to ideas of how to govern ourselves better. We agree to kill each other and die, and yet, something luminous gives us away there in the darkness of our experiences. Exupery talks about the sound of the voices, their echoes, and the silence between the calls. To me, he has entered the space that every writer dreams to enter. That silent but keen, attentive to the point of tension, listening space, where literature senses our frail and yet alive and breathing humanity. Here is the passage. The call swells, unfurls, floats across the valley and echoes back. Crouched behind the wall, we listen. No sound of a shout. Yet, we cannot say that we have heard nothing at all, for the whole night is singing like a seashell. The sound moved across the valley like a ship newly launched, 800 yards to the far shore, 800 back, 1,600 yards. Well, it is true that with writing this novel, I only got as far as hearing the sound of my own call as a writer echoing that. But this is enough for now. Like Seamus Heaney said in his poem, Personal Helicon, I rhyme to see myself, to set the darkness echoing. Okay, I'd like now to share screen um, so I can uh, show you the documents that I was talking about at the beginning of, the, uh, of this talk. Um, here is the um, work order, well, one of the work orders for Cecilia de Aponesa. Um, where we, um, we, we are given information um, on uh, where my mother, my mother here, Buganyara, where she was uh, located in the, in the hospital. There is stuff that has been blocked out, so I, I'm not sure what else they've done to her. There are some names here um, of people who are um, enlisted to see that people have code names and people have real names. And here's uh, Cecilia Diaconasta, um, where she is uh, on, on March 12, 1983, where she's going into the hospital. These are the other people. Um, and here is uh, one of the um, reports, report, <laughs> uh, given um, uh, by Cecilia Diaconasta and um, about my mother regarding my father, the gun. And I'd like to just show you the here. Uh, this is her handwriting, which has informed my character <laughs> in the novel. And here is her signature, which I think will make a, a really awesome book cover. <laughs> okay, I look forward to, um, your questions during the, the conversation that follows this talk. Thank you very much for listening.